Good afternoon and welcome to today's live Facebook chat with Administrator Jackson of the EPA and Chair Sutley of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Before I turn to our two speakers, I'd like to remind everyone that to ask questions, you can go to whitehouse.gov slash live and click on the Facebook link. I'd like to turn it over to Chair Sutley. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very excited to be doing this Facebook chat today on a very important subject, environmental justice. Today at the White House, we're hosting almost 200 environmental justice and government leaders uh, working uh, very hard on identifying places that we can work together to promote uh, health and a healthy environment for all Americans. For too long, some communities have borne a disproportionate burden of pollution, affecting their health, affecting their economic prospects, and we as a government and as a society have a responsibility to do something about it. So we're here today uh, it, it, at the White House hearing great ideas from across the country, and we're really glad you could join us today to have this chat on Facebook to hear your ideas as well. So uh, give us your ideas, give us your thoughts. This is the start, really, of a dialogue all across the government agencies are trying to figure out the things that they can do to help to promote a healthy and prosperous environment for all Americans. Thank you. Administrator Jackson. Thanks. Well, good afternoon and hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you on Facebook today. I talk a lot at EPA about expanding the conversation on the environment and, the envir and environmentalism. I don't know how we can expand it much more than this. It's very exciting. You know, as Nancy said, for too long, environmentalism is seen as almost a luxury item, something that you can afford to think about after you cover everything else. But we know, we now know, and President Obama knows, that it's anything but. It's the basis for our prosperity. Clean air, clean water, clean land for all is a, it should be a given. But it's still unfinished business for us in the environmental movement. So I always talk about expanding the conversation on environmentalism, and that's a mouthful. But it means thinking about air quality in terms of its impact on an inner city kid who has trouble breathing on a hot summer day. The impact that that child's inability to breathe has on his caregiver, his mother, his father, his grandparents, who now have to take off a day of work to try to uh, deal with his stress. Or the impact that a brownfield can have on a city block, blocking out opportunity, and what it can mean when you clean up that land and bring opportunity into, um, into that community. So we've done a lot so far in two years. I don't want to spend time on accomplishments because today is about listening to you. But please know that I join Chair Sutley and President Obama and, and many of our fellow cabinet members who were present in the White House today speaking to EJ leaders in understanding that the environmental justice agenda is the environmental agenda for many, many Americans. Thanks. Thank you. We are also joined today by students from Occidental College in Los Angeles. And I'm going to turn it over to LA's Deputy Mayor, uh, Romel Pasquale, to uh, introduce the students. Great. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me thank you, Administrator Jackson and Chair Sutley, for your tremendous, tremendous leadership on environmental justice. And we're very pleased to, to have this forum for this iChat here at Pasquale College, particularly because this is the school where President had a start in a lot of his activism work. And let me first say also thank Martha Matsuoka from Occidental College for helping put this together. And as you know, Los Angeles has been really the start of much of the environmental justice movement, certainly in California. And we've learned quite a bit from the lessons. And we've also learned that it really requires a lot of capacity building and youth leadership. And we're excited that you're going to have this conversation here at Occidental with, much, with many of our youth leaders and our grassroots organizations to, to move forward this very important issue of environmental justice. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Bob Gottlieb, who's the professor here at Occidental College and also the director of uh, Occidental College's Urban and Environmental Policy Institute. Thanks, Ramel. Um, it's a pleasure to, to host this session with both students and uh, young uh, members of the community, um, many of whom experience these issues of environmental justice in their daily lives. Um, you know, these nine students and community members who are going to be dialoguing with you weren't even born when the term environmental justice first emerged uh, in the 1980s, 
but they know um, from their daily lives what those issues are about. Uh, they're going to be the next generation, along with their peers, the next generation of environmental justice leaders, and they're going to be a force for something. So we're really pleased that they have an opportunity to both tell their stories, who they are, what their ideas are, and ask you questions about things they feel are really critical to bring about the, the change that uh, needs to happen. So we're going to start with Maddie. Hi, my name is Maddie Gauna Jr. and I am an 8th grader. I live in East Los Angeles and I am with Easter Community for Environmental Justice. I live in a community where maybe one or two of you have lived in when you were younger. Like me, when you were growing up, you may have not have clean air to breathe. You might have said to yourself, when I grow up, I will do something about it. And now you actually have the power to do something about it. But if you didn't live in a neighborhood like mine and haven't seen what I've seen, imagine living next to a big rail yard, two major freeways, and a factory that brings in a lot of trucks into the neighborhood. My, now imagine next to all that, an elementary school where my little sister attends, a park where I play, a daycare center, and the YWCA where my grandma goes in the morning, and homes. Now, oh, these things are not a good combination because it affects kids when we want to go out and play. When we are out playing, we breathe in all, all this air in and damage our lungs. I'm hoping you can do something about the air pollution in our neighborhood. Thank you. And my question is, what have you done about rail yard pollution and what more can you do to protect kids like me? Well, I'll go first, Maddie. Wow, what a great question. You know, um, rail yards are a huge source of pollution and California has actually been uh, some of the leadership for our country in recognizing the contribution that rails make to air pollution. But wherever you find a big source of pollution, you actually have a great opportunity to address it. So we are looking right now at EPA at ways to work with the rail industry, some of them are being very cooperative, some, <laughs> um, to look at ways to bring cleaner engines in, especially on short hauls, so that in your neighborhood they are not um, a large source of pollution. And we're going to do that uh, working with other agencies. Of course, the Department of Transportation is going to be really important. And that's why meetings where we bring all the agencies together are important. I have to say one other, give one other shout out, I guess, to one thing that should make a difference for you and your grandma and your friends and your family. And that's the clean car rule that President Obama put forth last year. Cars in this country are getting much, much cleaner. By 2016, they'll be burning 35, uh, they'll be getting 35 miles per gallon of gas, and every time you don't burn a gallon of gas, that's less pollution. They're gonna get even cleaner after that. And so if we work on cars, and we continue to work on rails and on shipping pollution, where we've done some great work, I think your life and the air quality for your friends will continue to improve. I would just add, you know, it, there are there are certainly um, a lot of places around the country where you know there is way too much pollution, particularly from uh, diesel uh, pollution from trucks and and trains and buses and things like that. But Los Angeles, in a way, is a real a real success story. It's a success story in cleaning up cars and factories and improving uh, the the air quality all around Los Angeles, which used to have. You know, and still does have some uh, some of the worst pollution in the nation, but there are fewer and fewer days uh, that the air is too polluted uh, for your health. And, and now we really have to, as Lisa said, focus on those sources that continue to be a serious problem. Uh, shipping, uh, whether it's uh, on big, big uh, ocean-going vessels or uh, trains and trucks, and that's a real important place that we have to focus on, and it does require lots of uh, participation from a lot of different federal agencies, but also uh, state and local government and communities, you know, to remind, to continue to remind us how important, how important these issues are. Okay, question. Can we get the next question? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Margo Balto, and I'm a sophomore here at Occidental College, and I also interned at Los Angeles Community Action Network. As a Native American born and raised on the Navajo Reservation, I have witnessed environmental injustice in many forms, from the hazardous, hazardous effects of the uranium mines to the many homes without electricity or running water. It's hard to see that the Navajo people on the reservation do not have access to basic human needs necessary for survival. Not only are these not only are these problems on the reservation, but they're also problems on other Native American reservations and underrepresented communities in the United States. 
As a summer intern with the Navajo Nation EPA, I was able to learn more about the causes of these issues and the continued struggle for improvement. Making sure rural, minority, and low-income communities have access to basic human needs for survival, which would, such as clean air, water, and electricity, is my, my main environmental justice concern. Here is my question. When I worked with the Navajo Nation EPA over the summer, I noticed that the Navajo Nation does not have the authority to enforce EPA laws unless the U.S. EPA gives approval first. I am wondering why the Navajo Nation EPA and other tribal EPAs do not have any jurisdiction to enforce EPA laws, and why can't they use their own judicial branch? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the Navajo EPA and our work with the Navajo Nation is probably one of the pillars of our work in Indian country. Uh, the Navajo EPA is actually uh, pretty sophisticated and pretty far along, and still you're facing the kinds of challenges that you spoke about in your remarks. Um, I, don't, I, I like to tell people what we've done, but also I want to start by acknowledging that we still have tremendous challenges in Indian country. Um, and much of what the work of EPA has been for, I would say, the first 20 years of the EJ program, not even 20, has been in building capacity. And EPA is very proud of the fact that across the federal government, um, when, when I speak to Native uh, American leaders, they say, EPA is furthest along in helping realize that we want to do for ourselves. We want our own interns. We want our own engineers and scientists. We want our own lawyers and our own canon and suite of environmental laws. And the Navajo uh, Nation has, in fact, put in place several of the laws needed to be able to take what we call delegation of major programs. And so we continue to work. I, I am optimistic that there will be programs that we will continue to be able to delegate full permitting and enforcement uh, to the nation. Um, if there are legal impediments, there are some in certain cases. There are some laws that bar our ability to do full delegation. And I'm sworn to uphold the law. And there, I think it's really important for us to work with Congress and make sure they understand that once the capacity is there, then uh, in tribal country, we want to see exactly what every state has, which is the ability at the state and uh, at the national level, in, in the case of Indian country, for self-determination. Thank you. Great. Before we move, uh, real quick, before we move to the next question, I just wanted to let everyone know that Administrator Jackson will have to leave us. So we'll take one more question uh, from Occidental College, and then um, we will switch to Facebook. So please go ahead with your question. Hi, my name is Juan Carlos Garibay. I'm currently a doctoral student at UCLA, and I'm involved with the Coalition for Safe Environment. We're headquartered in the city of Los Angeles, a community of Wilmington, which is home to the Port of LA and adjacent to the Port of Long Beach the two largest container ports in the U.S. Unfortunately, these two ports are also the largest source of toxic emissions in all of California. A public health crisis in our predominantly Latino, lower class community continues to exist because of the lack of action on the part of branches of government to drive the implementation of 21st century zero emission technologies in our ports and in ports across America. Our residents are suffering from such policies and that a disproportionate amount of our residents are suffering from uh, a disproportionate amount of our residents and children, like my sister and my young cousins, have asthma, heart disease, cancer, and other related health issues caused by diesel particulates and poor pollution. Reiterating Michelle Obama's underlying message behind the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act signed into law a few days ago, nothing is more important than the health and well-being of our children, and our hopes for their future should drive every single decision that we make. And what's the point of uh, children eating healthy foods if they're still breathing in deadly toxins that hampers their educational outcomes. The most significant issue to us right now is the newly proposed Federal Transportation Reauthorization Bill and amendments. And we've noticed that they do not represent the best interest of EJ communities, and they will allow ports and freight goods moving industry to continue to cause significant negative impacts on our communities. Here are my question. Why have EJ organizations not been asked to participate in the writing process of this bill and other bills to guarantee that the health of our children is at the forefront of all relevant pieces of legislation. And why have you not rewarded this bill to require the use of zero emission and maximum achievable control technologies such as magnetic levitation and electric trains as opposed to what is stated currently? That is to require polluters to simply consider new technologies. 
which will ultimately lead to the implementation of technologies that still pollute our communities. If you don't mind, I'm going to go first. Um, and the reason I have to leave, I wouldn't leave this, this is fun, is to go make a big uh, enforcement announcement with the Attorney General. Um, and I want to address uh, the parts of the question I know. I, I don't do the Federal Transportation um, Bill and Act, but you had some pretty good points in there about how EJ communities should be uh, heard from and included and consulted as regulations are being done. EPA just put out its plan EJ 2014, and that's exactly what Lisa Garcia, my senior advisor for environmental justice, has done. EPA now has, for the first time in its 40-year history, a process, which is now part of the skeleton of the agency, if you will, for including environmental justice consultations um, and um, environmental justice issues in our permitting and rulemaking. So if a rule is from the beginning leaves out those issues, then it has a tremendous blind spot. I also want to tell you that um, two things. First, I, I hope you know that in this administration, everyone is aware of the significance of the sources at the Port of LA and Long Beach. In fact, I visited there myself. I did it actually on a good news day. It's always fun. Uh, but I was with the governor um, and your mayor to give out diesel uh, retrofit money for the trucks that use the port. The biggest killer uh, from an air pollution perspective is small, tiny particles, the PM 2.5, as you well know. And one of the most significant actions on that in, in history, I think internationally, happened early on in the Obama administration when with the president's support, this country led the world in going to the International Maritime Organization and lobbying for a 200-mile buffer around the entire coastal United States in, in which only lower sulfur fuels could be burned. So you can right now burn very high sulfur fuel in many ports around the country and certainly around the world. Huge particulate matter, PM 2.5 emissions, they are killers. This country led the world in saying we don't want that um, um, burned around um, uh, our coastline. It was based on work done, of course, in California. Um, we estimated that the lives saved from that one action just in our country alone, the hundreds of thousands of lives saved every year would extend as far as Kansas. So um, although EJ communities who are right there on the front line get the primary benefit, it's just good sense um, to invest in those kinds of um, uh, win-wins on health. Yeah, and I think uh, your question about the transportation bill is, is a good one. Uh, and I think it points out that you know, environmental justice isn't, isn't just a, a problem that the EPA has to deal with or the Council on Environmental Quality has to deal with, that this is really an issue that all federal agencies have to deal with. And this forum that we're having today at the White House, uh, the president's leadership involves so many of the federal agencies. And I think it also points out the, the importance of involving uh, these communities, all communities, in the consideration of these big pieces of legislation. You know, the transportation bill is very important. Uh, there's a lot of federal money that goes towards transportation, and it has a tremendous impact on the environment. Uh, there are other things as well, like the Farm Bill uh, that, that sets up our agricultural programs, where there's a tremendous impact on the environment. And, and I think it's, it is uh, a message that uh, we in the federal government need to continue to hear that, that communities across the country want to be engaged in these discussions. And, and I, I think the other thing on transportation, I think, as you point out, is it's, it's a problem that all levels of government have to deal with, whether it's the, whether it's the city of Los Angeles, uh, uh, the home of the, the port, uh, whether it's the state of California, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, uh, the federal EPA, the federal Department of Transportation. Everybody's got to be uh, engaged in this issue. And the last thing I would just say is that um, we, we, think about, uh, we think about our environmental laws as uh, very fundamental to protecting public health, but they have another really important function, which is to help to drive innovation in technology. And in the end, you know, we'll continue to need to move goods all around the United States, uh, whether it's food or T-shirts or whatever, and we have to find ways to do it cleaner in ways that protect the communities that are most affected by it. And it really means that uh, our environmental laws have to function as a way to help to drive innovation in technology. 
Great. Before we move to more questions from the students at Occidental College, let's take one from Facebook. We've got one from Jacqueline Ostfeld. Uh, emerging research demonstrates numerous positive health and wellness impacts on youth when they have significant exposure to green spaces. How can we ensure that there are enough safe and accessible green spaces where children and youth from all socioeconomic backgrounds can have adequate opportunities to play and recreate? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we started uh, something about uh, six, eight months ago now. Uh, we launched something with uh, the uh, Department of the Interior, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the EPA, and the Council on Environmental Quality, uh, and uh, at the President's direction, something we call America's Great Outdoors Initiative. And this is really um, focused on what is the land conservation legacy that we as a nation want to leave uh, for this generation and for the future. And I think in a little different way than uh, the f sometimes the focus has, has been on, you know, saving the Grand Canyon or uh, Yellowstone, but that we really need to start with, with our communities and what uh, access to open space to the outdoors means for our, for our health, for our, for our children, uh, for our economy, uh, whether you're in big cities or in, in rural areas. And so we've been going around the country all year uh, talking to folks across the country about what are the real opportunities and tools that we have uh, available to, to expand uh, outdoor and recreation opportunities for all Americans and urban parks are a really critical part of it. Uh, big landscapes uh, in rural areas are a really important part of it. And it's something we encourage all, all of you uh, who are interested to get involved in and to take a look uh, uh, on our website and on uh, the Department of Interior and others uh, to look up the America's Great Outdoors Initiative. Great. I think we've got some more students with us at Occidental College. Great. Hi, guys. We'd like to uh, turn it over to you guys for your questions. Okay, I'll start. My name is Alexandria Brown. I'm from the Bay Area in Northern California, and I'm double majoring in Spanish and Urban Environmental Policy, and I intern at Scope Agenda in LA. Um, environmental justice is a concern of mine because I feel like it's a reflection of some of our most prevalent issues in society that we tend to ignore, like racism, poverty, and the lack of governmental regulation. And as you know, our communities of color suffer the most because we work and live by these power plants and refineries. For instance, I live by the Chevron Richmond Refinery, and we have a number of health concerns like asthma, cancer, and brain effects. And pollution not only affects our communities of color, but also the entire world because of global warming. So I believe that clean air should be a basic human right. So I'm just wondering why there isn't more regulation on pollution. So my question is, what pieces of legislation do you plan on implementing that will significantly reduce the level of pollution allowed in our country, such as pollution from the refinery in Virginia? Well, a, a, great, a great question. A part of it is we, we have a, a great foundation uh, underway. Uh, the Clean Air Act uh, celebrated its 40th anniversary this year, and, and all across the United States you can see the real dramatic improvement uh, and, and dramatic drops in levels of pollution in our air, but there's still too many places around the United States that, that suffer uh, from high uh, unhealthful levels of pollution, uh, particularly around you know, the ports and refineries and a lot of communities that are exposed to high levels of pollution. And so part of it is, uh, I, I think as Administrator Jackson said, is you know, EPA is, is on the job and they work with, uh, with states and with, with local communities to ensure that, uh, that the Clean Air Act is, is uh, being followed and, and that, that they're doing everything they can to, to set tough standards that will protect public health uh, and ensure the health of our communities and the prosperity of our economy. But there's another issue that you touched on uh, and related also to the, to the challenge that global warming uh, uh, poses for our, for our planet, and that is a lot of, the, a lot of our pollution uh, uh, originates from our, our use of energy. And so the president has uh, put a lot of emphasis and a high priority on helping to move the United States to a cleaner energy economy, more renewable energy, uh, 
uh, more energy efficiency that'll that'll clean our clean our air and save us money. Uh, and we put a lot of uh, money through the Recovery Act and investments in clean energy technologies uh, and clean energy strategies. But it's a really important thing that will lay the groundwork and lay the foundation not only for a prosperous 21st century, but for a healthy planet. I'm a member of the Department of Justice at the Communities for a Better Environment, and I'm from Wilmington, California. Wilmington is a low-income community of color surrounded by oil refineries in the port of LA. As a result, my community has been impacted by multiple sources of pollution and suffer from health issues from the pollution. I myself suffer from asthma. Youth for Environmental Justice and Communities for a Better Environment have been working on the Green Zones Initiative. The vision for the Green Zones Initiative is to reduce existing environmental pollution and improving land use decisions. This investing in sustainable community-based development and increasing community capacity and power. My question to you is, what contribution can the White House establish to the Green Zones Initiative? Well, you've raised a great issue, uh, the question about uh, how we use uh, land, uh, what we do with it, and uh, we have been, um, we have been working in the Obama administration. Uh, one of the great things about this administration is everybody works together really well, and agencies um, take on these environmental issues, even if environment isn't in their name. And so there's a, a great partnership that's uh, been started uh, between the Department of Transportation, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the EPA to help to find ways to work with communities uh, in something they call the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. And so we're looking at all the tools that we have available in those agencies and in others to help to promote uh, more sustainable communities, uh, more walkable communities, communities with greater green space, with, with less pollution, and communities that are healthier. And, and I think, again, this sort of points out how important it is to, to expand this conversation beyond just uh, the very important work that our friends at the EPA do, do but also to, uh, to every other agency. And if you think, for example, um, the partnership that the First Lady has on, the, on Let's Move is really focusing on how uh, health, the health of children uh, is related to all sorts of things, uh, including what kind of foods people eat, uh, how much time uh, kids spend outside playing, uh, what kind of pollution are they exposed to? So we always have to look for where are the opportunities to work together uh, within the federal government to work also with our communities to help to um, ensure the communities have information to begin with uh, and opportunities to advocate for their position and ways to influence uh, how, how agencies think about uh, the problems that they're trying to, uh, trying to address. So, uh, we'll keep we'll keep working on it, and we hope you will keep working on it. We'll take one more question from Occidental. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Sim. I'm a senior at Occidental College from Los Angeles. Um, to me, environmental justice relates directly to human health and well-being. I have seen how family members from ill exposure to diesel exhaust at his workplace, and I grew up as a child with asthma. Then I met Jimmy internship experience at Easter Communities for Environmental Justice, an organization that deals with the disproportionate burden of industrial and air pollution. I realized this is all part of a greater problem that affects people across the LA region and indeed the world. So my question is, how will we ensure that environmental justice, particularly health criteria, is included in decision making about funding major highway projects such as those in the stimulus bill? And also, how will you ensure that the Clean Trucks Plan, which addresses diesel pollution at the ports of Los Angeles, can be implemented across the country? So I think the, the, uh, the, there, are, there are a couple of things I would just say on, on, on health criteria. I think there, there are a couple of uh, existing ways that uh, we can, can consider those in highway projects. And that one of the ways that we do that uh, is is through 
the, the review of federal actions under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Uh, they, this is a law that's been around since 1970 that created the Council on Environmental Quality, but also required federal agencies to consider the environmental effects of all actions that they take. And that includes looking at health impacts and uh, working with our partners uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control, there's a lot that we can think about in terms of the links between pollution uh, and public health and how we consider that uh, as agencies uh, like the Department of Transportation that funds many of the transportation projects around the country, how they think about uh, the, the kinds of projects that they're funding. So there's always opportunity to do better, uh, to do more. But, but at its heart, this, these environmental reviews are, are uh, a way to get the public involved. Uh, this is an important part of the way agencies uh, do their business. And we need to ensure that we're reaching out to the public and that the public um, is providing us uh, information and thoughts and ideas and concerns as agencies think about the kinds of projects that they do. And this has been a very uh, powerful tool uh, across the country. California has uh, its own environmental review statute, which also has had a very uh, profound effect on the way that agencies think about uh, projects uh, that they fund, actions that they take to ensure that they're fully uh, considering, the, uh, considering the health impacts of those projects. Great. Before we take some more great questions from Occidental College students, let's go back to one more from Facebook. Okay. Uh, this one's from Donna. When are you going to educate Americans on exactly what is happening to our Earth? I think a lot of Americans don't really realize what is happening to our Earth and that we bear responsibility. Then they would understand why there must be regulations. Someone must be held accountable. When are you going to start an ad campaign showing Americans? Please educate. Well, that's a, that's a, great, uh, it's a great question and a, an interesting suggestion, but it, I, I think that uh, one of the one of the things that the federal government is sort of uh, does uh, is u sort of uniquely positioned to do is to provide information. We do a lot of research. There's been um, for many years uh, a science and research program on, for example, global warming. What are the causes of global warming, and what are the impacts of global warming? And and part of the challenge in front of us is to is to provide information to people who have to make decisions about. Uh, about how, for example, global warming will, will, you know, will affect our daily lives. And you know, we, we start, we've, we're seeing those effects already in places uh, like in the Arctic, uh, where uh, Alaskan native communities are seeing the effects of uh, shrinking uh, sea ice uh, and a changing, uh, and changes in way of life. We're seeing it in terms of how we manage, for example, forests uh, that they're seeing uh, trees and, and animals that n never showed up in those climate areas uh, before. So we, we have an obligation, I think, to provide that kind of credible uh, uh, and um, uh, peer-reviewed science out, out into the public. Uh, but I think there's also a responsibility that we all as Americans have in educate, not only educating ourselves, but thinking about the things that we do in our everyday lives that have an impact on the environment. And each one of us can make a difference in our own environment. We can, whether it's uh, recycling uh, or you know, taking the bus instead of driving or any number of things that are very simple to do, uh, we all as Americans can do those things too and have a profound effect on our own communities. Let's take some more questions from the students at Occidental College. Hi, uh, my name is David Telford. I am a junior here at Occidental College. Um, I've had the privilege this semester of interning at Community Coalition, which is a community organizing group out here in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, um, and uh, Brooklyn and Los Angeles are very two different cities, but one of the things that I've seen um, is really important is that impoverished communities in both of these places get mobilized around environmental justice issues. I think that one of the best ways to do this um, is to have um, good schools. And not only schools that are in clean, safe environments, but also schools that have a robust curriculum that infuses um, social responsibility. 
Um, many times people in these communities um, may know that something is wrong with their health or the, you know, or the air that they're breathing, but they aren't equipped with the tools or the knowledge to really articulate their vision for a better community or get involved. So my question is from um, the EPA's uh, perspective or CEQ, how do you think um, we would be able to, to transition to maybe work with the education department to make sure that schools are infused um, with uh, environmental justice in their curriculum? And as a related question, um, how do you feel that communities can get more involved um, in the environmental justice movement, whether that be the EPA supporting community organizing groups or churches or programs like the Harlem Children's Zone? Great. Well, I think that there's there's no more more important issue that uh, that we deal with than in ensuring the the health uh, all the way around for for the next generation. And again, I think the involvement of of youth uh, in environmental issues has been incredibly important. And I think a lot of the desire to know more comes from come from children in schools. And so uh, the EPA has an important. Uh, function in, in promoting uh, environmental education, many states do, uh, and 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 the public does in sort of asking for uh, for those kinds of, of programs, and and I think again it just reinforces how important it is to think about for us as a federal government to think about environmental justice uh, and environmental issues as cutting across everything that that the government uh, that the government does and so for example on on our America's Great Outdoors initiative uh, we as we went around the country talking uh, to Americans about the importance of access to green space and places to, to play and hike and uh, fish and do all of those things. We, we um, at every place that we went to, we tried to engage with, with youth leaders and we found just a tremendous uh, amount of, of, of interest and desire and yet a frustration that, you know, it was hard, hard to do and that, you know, that we as uh, the leaders in government had to think about ways that we could we could partner with organizations, uh, whether they're concerned about outdoor uh, access or, or environmental issues as they affect youth, you know, f find more and more ways to engage. And I think, uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit older than, uh, than all of you, but this kind of, um, the ability to use technology uh, to reach folks, whether it's Facebook or uh, other ways that we can use the great technology tools that, that we have and that we know folks uh, really depend on for information. We're always looking for ways that we can do that. Hello, I'm Kristen Leahy. I'm the daughter of a Caribbean immigrant who achieved her citizenship in 1992. And my great grandparents immigrated from Ireland to Boston in the early 1900s. Originally, I'm from the greater Boston area, but now I'm living in Los Angeles where I'm currently a senior at Occidental College. I am anemic, like many women and women of color. That is why access to healthy, affordable food is very important, because if my iron level is too low, it negatively impacts my productivity um, within the classroom, at school, and also where I work. Um, I believe by ignoring the lack of healthy, affordable food in communities like Boston and Los Angeles, people's health and economic productivity are jeopardized when they have to make the decision, make the decision to buy a Big Mac over fresh produce um, because we'll feed more mouths since produce and um, access to nutritious um, foods is too expensive. Uh, here's my question. This is some background, but um, the Urban Environmental Policy Institute in Los Angeles helped establish the Farm to School program that supports farmer and school bacteria relationships and healthy food, food educational programs which educates the youth in the importance of nutrition. Um, the best way to secure healthy food is local food grown. Um, here's a question. How is the government supporting local food projects that support communities and farm relationships and use this food to build healthy school food and overall healthy environments, not only for students within the educational system, but also children throughout America? Thanks. Great question. Uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the president signed a childhood nutrition bill, uh, one that the uh, first lady has made a real um, a, a, a real cause for her, and she's been uh, really uh, focused on promoting uh, healthy lifestyles and healthy eating for 
uh, for our, our youth, uh, for children. Uh, the, uh, he, she turned uh, the White House garden uh, into a vegetable garden and has kids from local schools coming in and have a, a relationship with local schools to help to provide, uh, provide healthy food. And it's just one way uh, that, that the First Lady can use uh, her public profile to help promote an issue which is very important, which is what we're eating and where it's coming from. And our colleagues at the United States Department of Agriculture have been working uh, very hard um, to, to help people to understand the connection between themselves and food. And so through uh, promoting community gardens, for example, uh, promoting gardens at, uh, at federal uh, buildings all across the country uh, through a, a program uh, they call Know Your Food, Know Your Farmer. I think that's what it's called. I'm really thinking about those connections, and certainly from a, from a health perspective, uh, from an environmental perspective, uh, from a, 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 a prosperity and uh, health of our communities perspective, uh, issues around food and food, where food comes from, ensuring that people have enough to eat, enough healthy choices, uh, is a real focus uh, for our colleagues uh, at the Department of Agriculture, our colleagues in the Health and Human Services Department, and, and for the First Lady. So she's been all around the country uh, talking to kids about healthier eating and healthy lifestyles. And so uh, there are partners all across the country um, who are responding to, uh, you know, to, to the First Lady's uh, initiatives. But it, but it helps, again, to bring a f focus to an issue that, frankly, most of us don't think about. We can take one last quick question from our young environmental leaders and students from Occidental College. Hi, my name is Simone Andrews, and I'm an organizer at Scope Agenda, and I've been working on creating quality green jobs here in Los Angeles. I find the most important environmental justice issue is the connection between environmental justice and economic justice. Working in South LA, a neighborhood with high levels of poverty and unemployment, I see a huge need for job training for low-income communities and workers. Folks really need the skills to get into the into the green economy. At the same time, communities like South LA, as we've heard, have been disproportionate have disproportionate amounts of pollution, which have serious health impacts. And I personally know this because both my brothers have asthma. So we've been we've been working really hard here in Los Angeles to create and build an equitable green economy. And in 2009, using federal stimulus dollars, the LA Apollo Alliance, a coalition of 24 community, environmental, and labor organizations convened by SCOPE, uh, passed a historic ordinance that would city owned buildings and create a pipeline to, to green union jobs. And so I was really excited about this accomplishment. However, in this economic recession, um, even with this ordinance, I, I, I continue to see um, communities of color still having a hard time with real green jobs. And um, even with, and because the city lacks the resources to fully implement uh, the vision of the ordinance. So my question to you, Chairman Sutley, is how can the federal government help community leaders to build a new green economy that addresses long-term poverty and inequities in our city. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, and it's a very important one. I think the president believes that uh, moving our, our country to a clean energy economy will create tremendous economic opportunity, and, and we have to work really hard to ensure that it does reach all parts of, of, of our society. You, you referenced uh, some stimulus money. Uh, I want to give you an example of, of uh, where Recovery Act money has gone. Uh, this morning uh, at our, our White House Forum on Environmental Justice, Labor Secretary Hilda Solis uh, spoke. Uh, she's been, uh, throughout her career, a great uh, champion and advocate for environmental justice. Uh, and um, the Recovery Act uh, provided for, uh, for the Department of Labor $500 million to help to support green job training. So that, that money uh, has, been, um, has uh, gone out and out to community-based organizations, uh, train, uh, training organizations, uh, states, local governments to help to, to build um, 
the, the core of people who know how to do, uh, do work in energy retrofits or other uh, ways of, uh, of, of promoting the, the clean energy economy. We at CEQ worked uh, at, at, at the request of the vice president on a program we called Recovery uh, Through Retrofit, which is to take the, um, to, to make sure that the opportunities that were created under the Recovery Act continue with respect to the home energy retrofit market. And a very important part of that was uh, looking at the certification of, of people uh, who work on uh, energy retrofits uh, to help uh, homeowners uh, save energy and save money uh, and to make sure that they're certified and trained. And we have a lot of partners out there, uh, uh, community-based organization, uh, trade unions, uh, 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 for-profit organizations who, who really are looking for uh, opportunities and for a pipeline of workers uh, who can, um, who can uh, participate in this growing clean energy economy. So there's a lot more work there to do in a very important issue and one we're always looking for new partnerships uh, where we can work to, to help to promote uh, th this kind of prosperity uh, in a way that benefits all Americans. Thank you, Chair Sutley. That brings us to the conclusion of today's live chat. Great. We want to thank our friends and young environmental leaders in Occidental College for participating today and everyone for submitting their questions on Facebook. Well, and thank you very much for joining us. These were terrific questions, and I think uh, we, we look forward to everybody's continued interest and participation in our efforts to ensure uh, that uh, all Americans have access to a clean, healthy environment and a prosperous economy. Thank you.